Are you looking to create your own Eurorack modules but find some of the electronics concepts intimidating? This video series may be just for you. In it, I'll cover a module that has some of the most basic electronics you'll find, the mixer. I'm Brian from Eurorack DIY, and I'm here to share with you how I make inexpensive Eurorack modules that sound and look great. A question came up in a comment on a previous video in this series about why don't we use the non-inverting inputs in our op-amp summing circuit instead of the inverting input. The inverting input adds voltages together, but inverts the amplitude of the output, making positive voltages negative and negative voltages positive. It's a great question, and examining the reason is a good way to think a bit more about how op-amps work in our circuits and look at some of the other circuit topologies and their strengths and drawbacks. First, let's take a look back at the summing inverting op-amp that we looked at in a previous video. If you recall, we needed a negative current flowing back into this node here so that the sum of all the currents would be zero volts. This meant that we needed to use the inverting input to be able to get a negative output at this point in our circuit. So the question kind of becomes, can we achieve the same sort of current math in a non-inverting amplifier circuit? So let's go ahead and take a look at a non-inverting op-amp circuit. This is the classic circuit that you'll typically see when you go out looking for, for the, the non-inverting op-amp for analysis. And you'll see the voltage in going directly to the non-inverting input. And you'll see a feedback network of a feedback resistor from the output to the inverting input and then another resistor from that same node to ground. And what we have to achieve in this particular case is we have to get the voltage at these two points at the same, at the same level as we've said before, uh, right, with no current flowing into either of, these, either of these nodes of the op amp. So to get that voltage to match, right, the output voltage is going to need to seek a voltage here across this what's basically a voltage divider that will match this V in. So let's go ahead and take a look at a real simple case of this where we have, have the V in from here. We're gonna go ahead and make this uh, feedback resistor be just a straight wire, which means a resistance of zero. And then we won't have anything going to ground here, which would mean a resistance of infinity. In this particular case, we can see that the output is going to seek to be at a level where the, it is exactly at the input, meaning that if you put an input of say five volts into it, you'll also get an output of, of five volts. If the, increase, if the voltage in incre increases a little bit, the non-inverting output goes a little bit higher, which means that the op amp will also take the output higher until it gets to a point where the inverting input matches what's on the output. This is typically a, called a unity gain or a buffer where it does nothing more than keep the same voltage on the input as the output. The reason you'd want to use something like this is that you can have you can have much more current on your output and you'll have like a very high in, impedance on your input meaning it won't load down the rest of the circuit and you could have many of these buffers say all hooked in common to the same uh, to the same voltage output without seeing a, a drop in voltage. So the thing to notice about either one of these circuits in either one of these forms is that the, that the feedback is still on the inverting input to the op amp. And in this case, we don't have that uh, negative current going to offset the input voltages available to us, which means we can't do something like, like put several other inputs here and then add them up using that, that feedback in that particular form. As a matter of fact, almost all amplifier circuits you'll see using, using an op-amp will have some form of negative feedback. And if you actually put your feedback loop into the, um, the non-inverting terminal, you end up with something different than an amplifier, typically an, an oscillator. So back to our need to have negative current, or more accurately, current in the opposite direction relative to our input currents, we see that for that reason alone, we pretty much are required to use the inverting form of the op-amp circuit. I suppose I could stop there with my explanation of why our mixer uses an inverting stage at its input, but there are some other things we're relying on that's interesting to talk about and will help us to learn a little bit more about op-amp circuits. To see one of those, let's talk about the gain of this non-inverting circuit. We could look up the formula 
for a non-inverting op-amp circuit gain, but what would be the fun of that? Using the simple circuit math we've used so far, we can calculate the gain for ourselves. So looking at this circuit, what do we need to do to be able to figure out what the overall gain of the circuit is? Meaning, uh, if we take a gain to be equal to V out over V in. So to be able to calculate the gain, we're going to need to find a way to relate V out to V in in the circuit. And we're going to have to go with, to start looking for things that we know about the circuit. So one of the things we know is that V out is, is reference to ground and therefore it's the voltage drop across these two resistors. Well, it would almost be that except we have this other node here that goes into the non-inverting input of the op amp. But one of the things we know about that is that there's a high impedance on the, on the inputs to op amps, meaning that very little current flows into them, almost nothing. And so we can assume that there's no current flowing out of here, and therefore that this is almost, as far as that analysis, you know, the voltage out to, to, to ground, that that part of the circuit is, is just a, a straight uh, voltage across two resistors in parallel. So also, from Ohm's law, we know that the, that the voltage output will be equal to a current, the, right, the current flowing through this portion of the circuit. And let's just go ahead and call this IR, meaning, or IF, meaning the current through the feedback portion of the current, uh, the, the circuit. And so it'll be, the volt, voltage out will be equal to the, the current of the circuit times the resistance, which is the addition of these two. So it'll be times the R feedback, plus R sub one. This still doesn't give us a way to relate the input voltage to the output voltage in, in our circuit using this equation. All we have here is V out in the circuit. What we need to try to figure out here is, or figure out what we're, we're missing here is we need to figure out this current that's flowing through here. And one of the ways we can do that is looking at the current through across R1. And in this case, because we said no current's really flowing to the non-inverting input, this will also be I, I sub F. So the other thing we know is that these two inputs to the op amp will be held at roughly the same voltage. In this case, we have V in here sort of setting the, the reference that it'll be. So from that, we can we, we also know that that this voltage here will be Vn, and if we look, we have Vn to ground, and we once again can use Ohm's law to solve for the current, the feedback current at this by knowing that the feedback current, or a, the current, is equal to a voltage divided by resistance. So in this case, it'll be Vn divided by R sub 1. Now that we know the feedback current going through here and, and, and also through, through this resistor, we can go ahead and plug this portion back into the original equation and we'll see that we have now have V out is equal to, we'll, we'll put this in in place of that, V in divided by R1 and then times the, the series resistance RF plus R1. And from here we can see that we have a, an equation that has both V out and V in in it. So now we can go ahead and, and seek to solve it into this form here. We can see that, that the first thing we can do is we can divide both sides by V in to remove this term from this side. So if we do that we get V out divided by V in is equal to V in divided by V in. We'll, put it the, in the same place, R1, and then times R feedback plus R1. These two cancel out, and we end up with this being R feedback plus R1, divided by this bottom portion here, the R1. The R1. Simplifying this even further, we'll go ahead and we'll move the R1, we'll swap places with these two. We can see that R1 divided by R1 plus R feedback divided by R1. 
And of course, we know that this is equal to 1, R1 over R1. So now what we get is V out over V in, or the gain of our circuit, we'll go ahead and call that the gain, is equal to 1 plus R feedback divided by R1. So why does this matter to us? Well, what you'll see here is that the gain is always going to be one plus the ratio of these two resistors. And in that case, it, can, it means it will never be less than one. And so why is that a problem for our mixer circuit? Well, if we go back and we look at how we were doing the master volume control in our cir circuit, you'll note that we, we went ahead and put made the feedback resistance be variable. We put a potentiometer in here so that we could vary that, and then that would allow us to vary the gain of the overall circuit and to have this go anywhere from a gain of zero, essentially to the way this circuit is configured with, with uh, these two being the same resistances, to uh, a gain of, of exactly one. And so, with a non-inverting op amp, we don't have that option because we can never get the gain below one. Uh, the best we can do is we can get it exactly at one, and so we can't actually make the circuit uh, attenuate or or bring the bring the sum of the input voltages below anything but the um, the actual that actual input. So, are these the only reasons why a non-inverting op amp configuration needs to be considered carefully? Not quite yet. There's at least one more, and it has to do with something called the common mode voltage of the circuit, and some quirks about how the TL072 op amp we're using, and many others for that matter, work. Common mode voltage can be thought of as the voltage that is common to both of the inputs, and in this particular case, we can see that we have achieved a circuit with the feedback where the, the voltage at these inputs is basically V in. If we go back and take a look at our summing op amp circuit, we'll note that we have the non-inverting input tied to ground, and so the common mode voltage of this will be roughly zero volts, and in this particular case, it will be VN. So if VN was five volts or whatever, we'd say the common mode voltage is five volts. For certain op amps, this isn't a problem. However, the TL072 and uh, many other op amps have this characteristic where when the common mode mode voltage goes outside of a specified band, the output will actually invert from what it should be. So if it should be plus five volts, it will go to negative five volts or, or wherever it can to its negative power supply or vice versa. And if we look at a, a data sheet uh, for the TL072 or 07X family, we'll see that they, they do have a specification here for the common mode voltage, what it, what it has to maintain within it. And if it gets outside of this range, it means it will put it into this mode, which they call phase reversal, or where the output won't be doing what it is we expect of our circuit. And we can see that it's specified that, that the common mode voltage needs to be kept within VCC+, plus, which is the positive supply voltage of the, of the op amp, and then the lower limit though needs to be VCC minus plus four volts. And in the case of uh, Euro rack circuits where our power supplies are plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts, this would mean that the inputs need to be kept above minus eight volts. This would be minus 12 volts plus four means minus eight volts. So if you ever were to have an input here that is you know, less than minus eight volts, say minus nine volts or minus 10 volts, it would cause this circuit to go into that phase reversal uh, uh, condition or potentially cause it to, and it would take V out from uh, the minus nine volts that it should be and probably make it end up being like plus nine volts. So as we saw, there are a variety of reasons that we'll be using an inverting op amp circuit configuration in our mixer instead of trying to use the non-inverting input. But does it really matter? From a pure sound perspective, it almost never does. It turns out we can't hear the difference between an audio signal and an exact inverted copy of that same signal. There might be cases where as we route the signal to different places in our modular system where it could matter, but we'll avoid those two because there's an extra op amp in the IC package we'll be using in our mixer, and we'll go ahead and run our mixed inverted signal into that amplifier, which will also be in an inverting configuration. This will go ahead and return the signal to the same phase or polarity as the original input. 
With this brief aside done, in the next video I expect to go back to the simple mixer we've been looking at and look at just a couple more things we might want to add to the circuit before diving into circuit board and panel designs. If you're interested in continuing to get this kind of content, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or things you'd like to see in the future, please leave a comment and I love hearing about the DIY projects everyone out there is working on themselves. Finally, I'm also on Instagram at EuroRackDIY, so drop by there too.